vendors. We're glad you guys are here with us. Welcome. Uh, if you have a hymn, let's turn to hymn number 231. Let's all stand. Oh, happy day. Hymn number 231. <laughs> Thank you. 
far. It's good to have a bunch of you visitors here today. The Patrick's Packed Mini Pew Sunday. <laughs> right? Amen. And uh, we've been talking about this for weeks, and the last time, Brother Bill wasn't feeling so good, but it was rescheduled, right? And uh, so we like this, and good to have you all here. We've got several visitors here this morning. Thank you so much for being here. If we can be any assistance to you, we want to do so, but you've got to let us know how we can help you. So you let us know, all right? We're not, we don't mind being told what to do. We, we do it best when we're told what to do, all right? So, and, uh, so let us know about that. Keep up with a few things. I won't go over them for sake of time. We've got a lot of things going on today. Uh, we have, uh, but in your bulletin, you'll find some events up and coming. One I want to make a real quick announcement about. Tonight, following the service, we're going to have a linger longer. That means we're going to linger longer. And uh, so, some of you say we do it every week, right? I know. And uh, we're going to eat tonight. How's that? And uh, uh, so, right after the service, we're going to have tonight, we're going to have a time of fellowship and some food. Uh, the main course is going to be provided. If you want to bring finger foods, of a light finger food, that'd be great. If you just want to come, that's wonderful. We just want you to be here. Just bring your fingers and eat the food, all right? And, uh, uh, but we want you to come hang around with us tonight right after service. And then don't forget, there are other things in your bulk of up and coming. We won't go through them all for sake of time. But it is good to have each other here today. Several visitors, thank you so much for being here. And uh, we're excited about seeing you and seeing you again. And some first-time visitors here this morning, we're thankful for that. Let's pray that's where it's blessing upon the day. Amen? And Lord, we come to you at this time. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to be in your house once again. Thank you for the freedoms we have in this country to come and assemble ourselves together uh, freely without government intervention, Lord, without fear of being shut down, Lord, that we can take the Bible and open it, declare the truth from God's Word. And Lord, I pray this morning the Holy Spirit would do a work like only you can. Lord, I pray that you speak to us, guide us, convict where necessary. Lord, convince, the, convince us, Lord, that following you and considering you in our life is the most precious and most important thing we could ever do. Thank you for every visitor here this morning, whether it be first time or whether it be repeat. Thank you for every faithful person, Lord, that's here every week. We're thankful, Lord, for every smiling face, everyone represented, and every family. Be with us now and guide us, Lord, this time. We'll give you the praise and glory in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. If you keep your hymnal, we're going to sing some more.
would. You know, we sang, Oh, Happy Day. We're singing, Save, Save, Save. Uh, November the 12th, 1978 was a happy day for me because that's the day I was saved. Anybody else want to shout out real quickly the moment that you were saved or when you trusted Christ your Savior? Anybody? December Susan. 22nd. June, do what? December 22nd. December 22nd. Wonderful. April 22nd, 1962. Amen. Anybody else? Yes. August 24th, 1954. Wonderful. Amen. Isn't that great? Yes. February 29th, 1954. Amen. Anybody else real quickly? Anybody? Yes. August 6, 2007. All right. Austin, did you say something? Oh, okay. All right. So, yes. Anybody else? Brendan? Go ahead. July 7th. July 7th. All right. Very, very good. Wonderful. I hope you... Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jamie. October 26, 1993. Wonderful. Miss BJ? Wonderful. Amen. Oh, happy day. Amen. Amen. Save, save, save. Wonderful. Thank you for that. That's a wonderful, wonderful way to start today is thinking about the day you were saved and thinking about if you've ever trusted Him, you still can. Amen? It's wonderful. But if you've never trusted Him as your Savior, you need to do so today before it's eternally too late. Yes? February the 7th, 1982. Wonderful. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. What a wonderful day, way to start the services. Amen? Ron, if you would ask for His blessing upon the offering. Oh, Lord, thank you for this wonderful Lord's Day, this time of offering serve you, worship you. Lord, we just thank you so much for saving us, giving us the Savior. Lord, uh, we just ask you to be with this service, be with the pastors who presents it. Open our hearts and minds to the message. Lord, just be with this offering as a prayer glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs>
hanging. Thank you for that. And thank you, guests and visitors, for being here today. We have a lot of things going on. Uh, we're thankful for what the Lord's doing. We've uh, got a baptismal service at the end of the service today, so I appreciate uh, you hanging around long enough for that and, and let the Lord speak to you and guide you and instruct us regarding that matter. Uh, if you have your Bible this morning, you'll be turning over to Luke uh, chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And today is Christian's birthday, and uh, he's 19 years old today. <laughs> and uh, Ron's going, no, don't worry, it won't be long, buddy. And uh, so, uh, but tonight we're going to have a little linger longer afterward, and we're have some time fellowshipping there. And we'll be singing to him tonight and some things like that and embarrass him as much as we possibly can. And uh, so we're glad you're here, so come back tonight. And I've had people ask me in the past, so when you have multiple services on Sunday, do you just repeat the same message? Nope, it's just a continuation. No, and, uh, no, 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 I just, uh, but we have different services. We study the Bible differently at different times, and, and uh, so we have a great time, so I invite you to go back tonight, and uh, we'll have a good time doing that, and we'll have a good service tonight, and then a little fellowship afterwards, and we're looking forward to that, and then also, uh, again, Monday in School of Bible, Tuesday evening, uh, Bible, men's Bible study, Wednesday night prayer, and a Bible study as well, 7 o'clock for everyone, and then a lot of things going on. Your bulletin have a record of those things. Again, ladies, if you need to sign up for one of the meetings uh, out of the four years to sign up, sheet and some information. Glad you're here this morning. Let's get started in God's Word. Amen? Luke chapter 12 this morning. We're going to look at just a couple of verses. And this theme has been on my heart for uh, a number of months, actually. And, and it's, I've been looking and trying to ask the Lord to help me with this. And, and uh, so we're going to try to hone in on it a little bit this morning uh, on Consider Christ. Uh, consider Christ. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 27, we'll read just a couple of verses. The Bible says, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? O ye of little faith, let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning, I thank you for this day once again. Thank you for the freedoms we have in this country to assemble ourselves publicly together, to study and proclaim God's Word. Thank you for everyone here this morning, every smiling face, every person represented, every family. Lord, I pray that you now would be with us and guide us at this time. Help us as we study your Word. Speak to our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm thankful for the testimony of salvations already this morning. Lord, we're thankful that you, lead, you live in our heart and once we invite you in, you come in and Rescue us, save us, forgive us of our sins, and cleanse us, Lord. I ask you to help us realize that in our daily life. Help us to remember that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins, Lord, if we'll just ask you to. Lord, help us to open the door when you knock. I pray, Lord, if there be anyone in this room today that's unsaved, that's never heard the clear presentation of the gospel, that's never understood what it is to be saved, that's never believed by faith in Christ Jesus, Lord, today, the Holy Spirit would bring convicting and they would do so. We're thankful, Lord, for the testimony of baptism to follow. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for this day. Again, be with us and guide us. May you receive all the glory and praise for what's done here. In Christ's name, amen. I mentioned earlier, I want to real quickly mention just again, to John Hughes' brother Bob passed away Thursday morning early. And so the moral service to be tomorrow. So be in prayer for uh, their family. And uh, in the service tomorrow, the Lord will be spoken. And they would be encouraged and strengthened and comforted at this time, okay? We have here in Luke chapter 12, beginning of verse 27, we read these two verses. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you little faith? We're talking about considering Christ today, and, and we want to consider Christ in our life. We'll consider Christ in all the areas of our life. When we think about our life in Christ, uh, first of all, we need to consider Christ regarding salvation. Uh, there's only one name given under, under heaven whereby men must be saved. It's not, it's not a name that you can be saved under. Of course you can, but it's the only name that you must be saved under. You can say, well, I'm saved, and, and I believe this, and I believe that, and I believe that. If you can't support your beliefs in the Bible, then I'm sorry to say this to you this morning, then you can't be saved. Because there's only one name under heaven whereby men must be saved. You have to come through Christ. There's no other way. You have to come through Christ. No man cometh to the Father, but, but by me, Jesus says. And, and we think about this. We look at this verse in Haggai chapter 1, verse 7. We'll turn there. But the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. 
When we, can, when we live our life and live our life before the Lord, every day we're living before the Lord. Saved or lost, we're living before the Lord. He is all and in all. He is everywhere. He, we, he is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He is all not present. Uh, he is all-powerful. He, he knows all things. He sees all things. He knows what can be. He knows what will be. He has the power to change your life and mine. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that if we trust Christ our Savior, God says we'll become a new creature in Christ. I love that. He makes us new. It's not the fact that we get remodeled. Now, I a television, a couple of television shows I like to watch about old cars and trucks and old vehicles. And, and, want, and, and they find out, they go out and search out, and they find people that they feel as good candidates. And these companies, these volunteers, and, and they, people volunteer and give their time, give their money, companies donate, and they'll help a family or an individual that has a dream of having this car restored. But you know the thing about it is, when they restore those cars, and I would love to have one of those, I told my wife, I said, you need to watch those shows when they first come on, because at the top of the screen it says to volunteer to donate, or you can also call in and give them a candidate. I said, you need to watch that show and call in and make me a candidate, you know? And uh, so, and, and, you know, I love watching those shows, you know? And I love, I mean, they do an amazing job restoring these old trucks and cars, you know? I mean, and, but here's the thing about it. They put the newest technology. They do the same old thing. I mean, I mean they, 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 they put new suspension, new exhaust, new motors many times. They new, new interior and stereos and paint jobs. I mean, they are, when they're done, they are gorgeous. But you know what, to be honest with you? It's still just an old car. Yeah. It's just an old truck. <laughs> if it was a 67 before they started, it's a 67 when they're done. It may have lots of 2016, 17 parts on it, but it's still a 67 model truck or car. That's what it started out as. Here's the thing about it. As good as that is, as good as it is to have our life remodeled, restored, remade, Christ does better than that. He says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. When you trust Christ your Savior, you don't have to worry about your past. The only way your past can hurt you is if you bring it in your future. <laughs> the way you can bring your past in the future by not giving it to Christ today. But seriously. The Bible says if we call upon Him and we ask Him to forgive us, the Bible says He's not only faithful just to forgive us for our sins, but He will scatter Him as far as the east is from the west. And He'll bury Him in the deepest sea. Never to be brought up again. When John saw a glimpse of heaven, he said, I see, or I saw, no sea. <laughs> Priest of Magic, one time on the Old Testament, Saul, and I asked him the question, the title of the sermon was, What did you see, Saul? <laughs> Because over and over again, the Bible says in the Old Testament that Saul seen David and seen the way David lived and seen the testimony of Christ on earth, God on David's life. And, and I, I suggest that what did you see, Saul? I ask you this morning, did you ever realize that when the Bible says that John was allowed and afforded a glimpse of heaven and he recorded it for us as God told him to? He said, I saw no sea. It, that, he said, what's the big deal about that? Because he buries our sins in the deepest sea. And there's no sea in him. They'll never be brought up again. They'll never be brought up again. He scattered them as far as east and west. I've never been to the north or south pole. Some of you have been close. But uh, to one or the other. But uh, if you go north and south, there comes a point where if you were holding a compass and you were going due north, you would get to the north pole. And when you crossed over the north pole and headed back south, your compass would go 180 you would be headed south again. It will never happen going east or west. There's never a time where the east meets the west. There's a place where the north meets the south. There's never a place where the east meets the west. The Bible says he scatters our sin that far apart, as far as the east is from the west. And there's never a place where they meet. So you don't have to worry about, well, but what if? Yeah, I know family, friends, workers, <coughs> class members, they'll bring stuff up from our past. And here's a simple reply to that. That's who I was. That's not who I am. That's who I was. Because all things have been made new. It's not just that I've, it's not I've been restored, I've been repainted, I've been freshened up. No, no, no. I'm a new creature in Christ. The Bible tells us to consider our ways. Hey, God, our, but hey, God, his, the Lord says consider your ways. When we think about our life, are we considering our ways daily? That's this morning. If you consider your ways, if you were to draw your last breath today, Wednesday night in our 7 o'clock service, we pray. For John's brother Bob. He was on our prayer so We prayed for him. Just a few hours later, he stepped into eternity. This past week, in the last two days, at least two people that we know of 
said to eternity that a week ago didn't know they were going to. The day before they didn't know they were going to. He said to eternity. Every one of us, if the Lord tarries his coming, the Bible says it, that it's a point of the man who wants to die. Death is going to happen. It's going to happen to every one of us. I know we don't like to think about it, and I'm not trying to get you to think about that. That's what I'm trying to get you to think about. Are we considering our ways when we stand in judgment for, before the king? Because the Bible says there are going to be two judgments. We need to understand something real quickly. It's not two judgments like we think about courtrooms today. It's not two judgments where there's a judge, God, sitting on a, a bench wearing a black robe, and, and we walk up and we have our prosecutor, you know, and we have our defense, and we walk up, we present our case, and we consider our works, and we can sweep, and we, we say, all right, uh, I've done these many good things, and, and the defense says that, and the prosecutor says, yeah, but they've done this many bad things, and, 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 and the judge says, well, let me, let me go into my chamber for a few minutes and consider this, and I'll come back with the judgment. That's not what it is. At no point in time will you ever stand before the judge that way. The Bible says he's a judge now. Every day of our life we stand before him. Every day. Salvation is not of works, as any man should boast. It's by grace through faith alone. It's not of works. So what it will down to is, we can, have we considered our ways regarding salvation? In other words, if our last breath, breath were to be drawn, if our, last, our, beat, our heart beat for the last time, is that what would happen? Would you be in judgment where it's called the Bema Seat? That's the judgment for those who trusted Christ. The word Bema means reward. Chase it real quickly. How many of you watched the Olympics before at least one time? All right? You've seen some kind of event, no doubt, so some kind of your life, every one of us have. And at the, at the end of that event, there's usually probably an award ceremony, whether it be a golf tournament, whether it be a ball game, a race, or some kind of award ceremony where they, where they award the, the rewards to the winner. That's what the word bima means. It's the rewarding seat. The judgment, everybody that was in the game has an opportunity to have those rewards. But some people don't get the reward because they finished too far back or they cheated or something. But they still was in the game. They were still on the team. They just didn't get the, the award. So I say to you, the bema seat for the saved, the judgment for the saved, is not the fact that we're going to stand in judgment like, all right, what have you done? It's good, we've done bad. No, no, no. It's going to be, here is the <coughs> rewards for what you've done with Christ since you've come to know him. Some will receive many. The Bible says crowns, and then there will be jewels in those crowns. Some, sad to be saved, won't receive any. But let me show you something real quickly. This is not a salvation moment. If you're at the bema seat, you've already made a choice to trust Christ your Savior. That's why you're at that judgment. The judgment is in the awards, in the rewards. Wait a minute, there's another judgment. Where if you've never trusted Christ your Savior, the time will come where you're going to have to bow and confess Jesus Christ. The problem is, if you already died, you're going to stand before God and you're at the judgment. And you're not standing there before the judge and waiting on your sentence. I mean, waiting upon them to determine guilt or innocent. There's no one standing at the gate of heaven. You know, St. Peter, like the cartoons, tell us, you know, standing there at the gate of heaven. And we're going to say, uh... You're in, you're not. You're in, you're not. You're in, you're in, you're not in. No, definitely not. No, no, that's not the way it's going to work. <laughs> we make our choice for us being eternity while the Bible says, on this earth. The Bible says, consider your ways. So you stand, if you stand before Christ at the judgment of the lost, you're already condemned, the Bible says. John 3, 8, 10, we are condemned already. So it's not what you have to do to go to heaven, what you have to do to go to hell. It's believe in Jesus Christ, your Savior, and you have a place secure in heaven. What do I have to do to go to hell? What can I, how can I live my life? How recklessly, how dangerous can I live my life up to the point? What's that sin that will send me to hell? Unbelief. It's not a lifestyle. It's not what can I do or not do. No, no. It's unbelief. And we want to live our life carelessly. We want to compare ourselves. One of them are like the Pharisees. We want to say, well, I'm not as bad as them. So therefore, I must be okay. People even say this. Well, I know some of the members of that church over there. And if they're going to heaven, I know I am. Does anybody say anything like that? Can I remind you real quick? There's never been a perfect person in any church ever. Yes. Yes. There's not. There's never been a perfect pastor, a, never, a, a, a perfect church member. There's never been a perfect any person on this earth apart from Christ. So we need to be careful that we don't judge the work of the Lord based upon sometimes the failure of men, the shortcomings of men. 
We need to understand that God is loving and He's compassionate. And when we sing the song, sometimes we call it a kid's song. It's not a kid's song. It's a doctrinal song. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Right? And the song talks about it taking a week to make the earth and the moon and the stars, but, it, but it's going to take Him a long time because as long as I live in His flesh, i got problems. So He's still working on me. But one of these days, He's going to give me a glorified body. So just you know, everyone that's ever trusted as their Savior. He's going to come back in the clouds. He's going to sound the trumpet. The voice of God is going to go forth. It's going to be the, it's going to be the bridal call. It's going to be that noise where the bride goes to meet the groom in the air. And on our way there, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, it's not a journey like, oh, I wonder how long this going to talk about good old times before there are good old times are taken away. No! In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we will be with Him. And the Bible said we will be changed. We're so glorified by you know what's the most precious thing to me? I know it's easy to say, well, I can't wait till that day when, when all these people that's aggravating me and all this agitation and all this stuff that's going on in our country and around the world will be over. No, no, no. It's what excites me is not the fact that everybody else is going to be changed. What excites me is the fact that this flesh is going to be changed. The fact that I won't have any desire of self and flesh and sin. The fact that I won't be tempted in a moment, this body will, will then match the glorified one of the Savior. And this man, in that moment, the spirit within inside of me will take on the outward expression of the body that Christ has glorified. It's going to be a wonderful day. But until then, what are we going to do? We're going to consider, we're going to consider our ways. In Hebrews chapter 12, we'll, we'll turn there real quickly. I'm trying not to rush, but I am trying to keep moving, so bear with me this morning. Uh, our people have already, some of our loving, very, very generous young men have already been pulling me aside this morning wondering how long we're going to be. And uh, they're trying to encourage me, you know, they're trying to help me, so I appreciate that. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set down, that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, notice that phrase, for consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. The verse, chapter 12, verse 1 says, we're compassed with a great kind of witness, but it goes on to say, let us lay aside every weight and the sin, which is easily said. So those are different things. The weight and the sin are different things. It would be listed twice if it was the same thing. Some things in our life are just plain old sinful, right? I mean, let's just be honest for a moment. There are just things we have that's sinful. The Bible says in, in James 4, 17, He knows to do good, do it not to Him, it's sin. Some things are just sinful. The Bible says do something, we don't do it, it's sinful. By the way, the blog today, the bulletin, uh, talks about some of the things that He says to do. <laughs> it doesn't say that He recommends them, it says we're to do them. So if we don't do what we know to do, it's sin. Some things are just sinful. There's no doubt about it. But there's another thing listed here, chapter 12, verse 1 of Hebrews. Some things are weights. Some things are just weighty on us. They're just things that drag us down, slow us down, wear us out. The Bible says this, lay aside, notice this real quickly, it says lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. These things set us apart out of the race that God has given us to run. They, they hinder us. They slow us down. They wear us out. They cause us to not finish as strong as we could have. Austin likes to run, and that's like an oxymoron to me. How can anyone like to run? You know, but, uh, but he enjoys running, and he runs races and, and, and different length races and runs and, and runs almost every day of his life. Now, honestly, did you run this morning? No, no, I got him. And uh, more back that to any Sunday, you say, yeah, we're going to see you around, you know, whatever. But he didn't do it this morning, so here's the thing about it. He likes to run. When Austin runs, more than likely, he doesn't go put on the heaviest leather coat that he has. He put, doesn't put on cargo pants and fill pockets with rocks. More than likely, he's wearing clothes that's fit for running, right? They're lightweight, they're, they're, they're you know, not cumbersome. Yesterday, Jake and I was working together quite a bit, and, and he had on a shirt. And last night, we were on our way uh, doing some things, and he said this. He said, Dad, you can have this shirt. It's a Diamondback shirt. And I said, why? He said, it's too big for me, and I don't like it. 
what it is, it was so big, I don't know, he was pulling at it because you know how it is when you wear stuff. And, and it, it cumbered him. So he said, I'm done with this shirt. He's laying it down. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever laid down things in your life because it cumbers you in your Christian walk? In your Christian race? Have you ever laid down things? You laid aside some things? Maybe not simple things. Talk about those plain old simple things earlier. Sure, we ought to lay aside the simple things. I think that's obvious to everyone. Sinful behavior should be put, put aside. But there's more than just simple things that hinder us. Sometimes they're just weighty things. Sometimes they're just hindering things. Things that just don't let us be what we could be. We don't run the race as fast as we could. We don't finish uh, as fresh as we could finish. We just find ourselves struggling more than we struggle. It's just weighty things. Notice this real quickly. When we find ourselves like that, the Bible says looking... Unto Jesus, verse 2, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down right in the fodder. There were some things that was weighty as Christ walked upon this earth. We say, was he sinful? No, no, no. But the sin of you and I was on his shoulders. Think about that for a moment. When he went to Calvary, there's a song that was sung a long time ago, and I think it's a great truth. How it, the song portrayed how it broke the heart of the one that wrote the song about how when they thought about it, it was their sin that kept him on the cross. It was our sin that he was carrying. It was our sin that he was paying for. He, was, he came in a likeness of sinful man. He didn't come a sinful man. He came in a likeness of sinful man. We'll look at a verse one to, to confirm that. But there was weights that he was carrying because he was carrying our sin. So notice this real quick. The weight wasn't anything that he had done. But it was the environment that he was in and what he was coming to do was causing him to be needful of laying them down. Do you know what he did? He nailed them to Calvary. Notice this real quickly. Look at the context and we'll see this. Chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, <coughs> who for the joy that was set before him, notice this, endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Calvary wasn't fun for Christ. We need to understand that. If we're not careful, we'll just make it some cartoon. We are so, the most so un... Or not, me right. We are the most desensitized generation I think, that there's ever been. We really are. We're desensitized. Everything. I heard a, a powerful statement this week that, a, uh, that a, a, a news reporter said. Powerful statement. He made us reference to some things that's going on in our country right now about the what they're calling hate crimes and, and, and diversity and, and talked about a lot of things. He, he was just making some things. He, he was just reminding us of some things and he made a statement. He said, listen, for those of you that really want to combat, that really, really genuinely want to combat, <coughs> combat discrimination and hatred, he said, quit making a big deal out of everything. <laughs> that means nothing for your cause. It's because when you do that, you desensitize us for when something needs to be aware of. We don't take notice of it. But what a powerful statement. Honestly, what a powerful statement. And sometimes in our life, we are so des desensitized with things that we, we think of Calvary, we think of Christ, and we think of Him hanging there, but we forget about the suffering that He did. He suffered more than any man has ever suffered. You think about how much suffering that you may have known someone or yourself like you've gone through. or Think about that. He suffered more than any man suffered. He not only was hanging on Calvary, but leading up to Calvary, he suffered. When he came to this earth, he knew what he was coming for. He was born and he may die. He knew he was coming to be the sacrifice of sin. There was a spirit of, I know what I'm doing. I'm God in the flesh. I know all things. He knew what he was coming to do. He took on a body so he could die for your sin for mine because he couldn't die. There couldn't be a sacrifice for our sin unless it was a bodily sacrifice. And none of us would be serious sacrifices because we're all sinners. The sacrifice has to be pure, clean, without spot or blemish. So he's, he allowed himself. It has to be put up for a period of time. By the way, the 30 years he walked on earth before he revealed who he was, he proved himself to be sinless. He was put up for a while. He was observed. And then walking among men, he was ridiculed and beaten and spat upon and, 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 and he made, made fun of him. And, and there were so many things that was done and then one day, he endured the cross, despised the shame, 
And the Bible says, now we find him, notice this real quickly, set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You say, I don't understand the sitting down part. What's the big deal? Because if he wasn't finished, he couldn't sit down. Some of you have worked with me before, and Jacob and Rebecca have worked with me a lot, and Crystal, and, and they know how I am, and I get tired just like everyone else does, but at the same time, the day is only so many hours long, you know? And one of the things that I don't like to do is slow down if I can avoid it before I'm finished. But Jacob will tell you, because he worked with me probably as much as anybody has, and he'll tell you, at the end of the day sometimes he gets tired. I get tired. Now I can say to you sometimes, Jacob, you're slowing down on me. You're slowing down on me, Jacob. We've got to get this done now. Come on. And I'll say to him many times, Jacob, let's just get it finished, and then you can go sit down. I've said that many times. Let's just get it finished, and you can go sit down. The problem is if he sits down before we're done, we don't often get done. So let's just, let's just endure. Let's just push a little harder, strain a little bit more, work a little bit harder, let's finish it, and then we can sit down. You know why Christ can sit down for another throne? Because he was finished. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. And now he's sitting on the right hand of the cross. Why is he sitting there? Why is he sitting there? Because he's the groom. And the groom is going to have a bride someday. The church, the New, the, the New Testament teaches us that, that those that touch Christ's favor will become the very bride of Christ. And the bride is being prepared, being adorned. The Bible says, hey, you like that? I love that. I love that picture. The bride is being prepared, adorned, dressed. And someday the groom's going to come in a cloud, the trumpet of God's going to sound, and that wedding march is going to be heard, and the bride's going to go to meet the groom. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be wonderful. He's sitting down because he, the work of Calvary was finished. Nothing else to do. Some people want to struggle with that and they want to say, well, but I don't know about salvation. I don't know if you can know you can save and how you can keep you saved. And are you telling me that I can be saved and then I can still mess up and still be saved after I mess up? Let me ask a question. Do you think that my kids have ever disobeyed their mom or I? Anybody? How many of you have seen my kids disobey my mom or I? You're generous that you have. Here's the thing. But they're still our children. Even in disobedience, they're still our children. Right? They're still our children. Uh, I can't believe you've done that. Maybe we can't believe it, but they're still our children. So we chasten, we teach and instruct that we ought not do that, just like God does to his children. He chastens those who we love the Bible. The Bible says He gives us the power to become, notice this, the sons of God. He adopts us into His family through the blood of Christ. We become adopted in the very blood of the very family of God. And we're His. And He's mine. This morning we talked about in the Song of Solomon, how we find out in chapter 5, or chapter 6, verse 2, we actually find out that she declares of her beloved, I am His, and He is mine. We find that out about our salvation. If you've ever trusted Christ, you know you're, 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 you're saved and you know that you're secure. And maybe there's been times in life where we struggle with that, but I don't know how. There's your thing. When He forgives our sins, what's He do with them? We, let's review real quickly. He what? He scatters them as far as these from the west. He buries them deep in the sea, never bring them up again. So let me ask a question. We struggle with our mind because we know what we've done. Don't we? Maybe not everything. The Bible says the heart is desperately deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? But we know enough that we've done that we know that we displease God. So we struggle with, well, how can I still be saved when I know I did that, when I said that? Let me ask the question real quickly. If he scatters from as far as east from the west, remembers them no more, raises them deep as sea, never bring them up, then he doesn't recall them. He doesn't bring them up. They don't get rehearsed like we do in our mind. It hurts us because we're mortal, because we're emotional. It hurts us because we, we know that. And what happens is we struggle with that to the point where we, we 
convince that we listen to enough that we convince ourselves that well, there's no way I'm saved. Let me ask you a question this morning. Again, if you've trusted Jesus Christ your Savior and He's faithful just to forgive your sins, and, he's, and he's, the Bible says He makes our body the temple of the Holy Ghost, if He moves in and He says He holds us, secures us in His hand, then who can open the hand of God? Then tell me how you can get out of the family. Paul says you become joint heirs with Christ. Amen. Paul says your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. If your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life, that means you're alive forevermore. You're not dead. You were dead in trespasses and sins. But now you're alive forevermore. Now, let me go real quickly. We're considering our ways. We're considering Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. He wasn't a sinner. But he endured more then you and I will endure because he, he endured the contradiction of all sinners. He paid it all. Nothing left to do. He sat down because he's finished. So we think about that this morning. Here's my question. Haggai says, the Lord says, consider your ways. If you know that you trusted Christ your Savior at some point in time, whatever that day is, this morning many of you testified of, and reminded us of, of the moment you trusted Christ. Wonderful. Wonderful. Hang on to that. Let me show you something real quick. Some of you may not remember the actual calendar date. That's okay. Hang on to that moment. Think about that moment. Consider Him this morning in that moment. Because here's the thing. You know what's going to happen today, tomorrow, next week, next month? As long as earth stands, as long as you and I live on it. Something or someone's going to challenge us to disbelieve that. Someone's going to say, well, there's no way you're saved if you said that. No, there's no way you're saved if you've done that. There's no way you said making that kind of decision. There's no way you're saved. And it may just be the devil himself tempting us with those words and those stones. So where do we go back to? We go back to Calvary. Because there's where he went and died for my sins. I mean, I don't care if my sins. He judged my sins. I know it's my favorite illustration. You're probably part of it. But it's still my favorite illustration. <laughs> when I take him those song books and stack them up as novels of my record of sin. Remember this is Calvary, right? Someone said we're going to that, But I took those song books and I slammed them against that wall. And they were nailed to Calvary. My sin was nailed to Calvary. Here's the thing about it. I know, and I beat myself up just like everyone else does sometimes about things I say, thoughts I have, attitudes, behavior. I beat myself up. Oh, I can't believe, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, Lord, I can't. We've all done that. Here's the thing back when I ask Him to forgive me, He is faithful and just to forgive me. Amen. So why am I bringing it up again if He's not going to? So you know what I need to do when I realize there's something wrong with my life? I need to ask Him to forgive me. It's just that simple. Yeah, that's too easy. It's just that simple. Not to say, oh, you know, forgive me and go out and do it again the next hour. No, no, no. <laughs> repentant heart. The Bible says repentance. The word repentance doesn't just mean you ask forgiveness. It means you ask forgiveness with the intent of never being that again. <clears throat> we think about our life and consider Christ. Consider your ways. Consider if you trust in Christ your Savior first and foremost. But secondly, Consider what you're doing with Christ once you say to Him. Because, listen, once you're in the family of God, you can't get out. But you don't want to be standing before the King of Kings as He passes out the rewards. And you stand there and walk away in the end. Oh, you're, in, you're already in the kingdom, buddy. You're already secure. A place prepared for you. But you don't want to walk away in the end. That's why the Bible says, let no man take them from you. Don't let any man take them. Not let's not give them up. God rewards us, and let's not let man take those rewards. Because if you're if you battle hard and you battle strong, and, and many times you, you, you're standing there and you think that you may have won, and all of a sudden they announce the other person's name, you go, oh. and even though you want to congratulate them, shake their hand, tell them good game, whatever you know, really in your heart you're going, I want to win. If you didn't want to win, then why did you enter? So I don't, I don't ever want to win. Then why did you even play the game? I'm not being silly. I'm being honest. You wanted to play the game and you were hoping you would win, right? I mean, the Diamondbacks don't start off every year trying to be the worst team. But they have a few years there and it looked like they started off trying to be the worst team, right? 
They wanted to win. So why didn't we ask about your life? And you live your life, you're considering your way, you're considering Christ. And lastly, Philippians chapter 2, we'll conclude with this. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, If there be any consol- if there, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look at verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. But this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Catch this, the King of Kings came to this earth without a reputation. He didn't come as a king. He didn't come... Everybody in here has, no matter what your background is, everybody has something you think of God. When Christ came to this earth, He came with no reputation of God. And He was God in the flesh. He humbled Himself at that point. That's what it goes on to say. <coughs> the Bible says, And took upon Him the form of a servant. The king now looks like a servant. Notice this in chapter 2, verse 7. And was made in the likeness of men. The Holy One came in the likeness of a sinful man. He looked just like everyone else he was walking around. Everyone else being sinners. Verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The death of the cross was significant because that was the most heinous death reserved for the most heinous of society. It wasn't just a, a, a sense of death. It was a sense of death for the biggest menace to society. He became obedient to the death. Not only that, but the death of the cross. And then it goes on to say, Wherefore, God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things of heaven and things of earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here's what it boils down to this morning. Consider Christ. If you've never trusted Him as your Savior, consider Christ. If you've trusted Him as your Savior, but you have some things in your life that you're concerned about, some things that are the weight of this world, the weight of some of your surroundings, the weight of the flesh is hindering you, then consider Christ and what to do with those things. Lay them aside. Lay them aside. Consider Christ. Because in doing so, we get to run the race more efficiently. We get to run the race more effectively. We get to run the race victoriously. Just this past week, I was talking to someone on the phone, and actually, they sent, I think it was a text they sent to me, and they were sharing that they were visiting a church and they were taking a request from the floor. It was March 20, as it was. They were doing a request from, <coughs> from the floor of the church. And they had three or four widows in the church. They said, we're going to let the widows... I'll take it back. It wasn't March 20, but it was now. My mind is so bad. But they said, we're going to let the widows select. And one of them... Oh, it was Joe and Durham, so it was. It was in Wyoming. But Pastor King, and that night he said, Pastor King said, we're going to let the widows make our selections for our songs tonight. And Miss Joanne lifted her hand. She said... I'm on the winning side. <laughs> and she said, and, and she said, after it's over with, she said, the Pastor King asked, did we sing that song the way y'all sing down there? And she said, I don't know if you said side right. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but here's the thing about it. We get, to live, we get to run the race victoriously. We get to stand in reward, not just standing there as spectators, we get to stand there as participants. We get their rewards that's been set aside for our service to Him because we considered our ways before Him. And some will say, well, I don't know if that's the right reason to serve the Lord. It pleaseth the Father to give to the Son. How many of you parents despise giving your kids a gift? You can't stand to see them laugh and giggle and smile. You never want to give them anything. Anybody? None? Don't it please you when you can give them something that they've been wanting? Don't it please you when you give them something that you know excites them? So it does the Father. So when we serve Him, when we serve Him for His glory, but He rewards us for telling His story. But the heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, I'm going to ask a question. I can't.